Hello, everyone, and welcome to Twilight 2021. We're stargazing with the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And just in a moment, we will go ahead and get started. But for now, if you see the little chat button at the bottom of your screen, could you go ahead and announce your name and answer the following question? Do you think there was ever life on Mars or will there ever be? And I'll go ahead and read out some of your answers. And we're just waiting for some. Sean says, yes, I think there has been and may still be life on Mars. All right. Anyone else? Danilo, uh, very likely. Future, very unlikely. Elena, yes and no. Heidi, yes, and one can hope. And just so folks know, you can also toggle your chat screen to say all panelists and attendees. I think tonight it's defaulting to just the panelists. So me and Steph and Hannah can see y'all's answers, but if you want to share with everyone else. <laughs> Thanks, David. Steven <laughs> says, I think there was life on Mars because the crater used to be a lake. Okay. The crater, um, there's a bunch of craters filled with water. I think that's why, um, uh, yeah. Um, Perseverance is at the edge of a delta in a crater. I want to double check that. But I think they, they generally, and um, yeah, the crater is where uh, Curiosity landed around too. Oh, let me check, <laughs> make sure. Um, oh, I was actually talking about a crater lake in Canada. I'm hoping to visit that's from a meteor impact. So it ties in really nice. <laughs> oh no, and by the way, all of y'all's assessments on if there's life on Mars or not, and you're all like, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe not, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. Congratulations, you all are reflecting the consensus of the scientific community, because there is not one yet. <laughs> the consensus is, we don't know. <laughs> yep. Very true. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone, for your input. Love all your answers. I just wanted to go over a little bit of quick housekeeping. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so all of your lines are on mute, but we still want to hear from you. So if you have any questions for our speakers, go ahead and use the Q&A button, which is below and um, near the chat button at the bottom. And then if you have any technical issues, you can go ahead and use the chat button. And I'm going to go and kick it over to Hannah now. Thanks, Stephanie. Well, welcome everyone to our final event of Twilight 2021, Stargazing with Astronomical Society of the Pacific and David Prosper. And I would like to introduce our presenters today. So Dave Prosper is the Astronom Astronomy Program Manager for Amateur Astronomy Outreach at Astronomical Society of the Pacific. That's a mouthful. Um, Dave has been presenting at Twilight for four years now, and we're so happy he's been able to join us from the other side of the country these last two years. Dave, I'm looking forward to your presentation, um, but do you want to give us a sneak peek about what you think? Do you think there will ever be life on Mars? Ooh. Um, all I'll say is that I've thought about it for most of my life, and I'll give all of my thoughts as we do our presentation, because I also have many contradictory uh, beliefs pertaining to life on Mars. Basically, I want there to be life on Mars, but that's kind of where it starts. <laughs> all right, we'll hear more about that very soon. Um, and then Stephanie Becker is on the board of directors for John Ray Land Trust and has been for three years. And she has been crucial in getting Twilight together for the last two. And she is great to work with. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us. And do you think there will ever be life on Mars? Thank you, Hannah. Oh gosh, like David, I think it would be exciting. And, um, you know, we'll see. I think as science, uh, we evolve and learn more, maybe maybe we'll find out more, but I'm looking forward to David's presentation. So thank you. And my name is Hannah Hodgson, Program Manager with John Muir Land Trust. And I think that there will be life on Mars because I think we'll be living there. That's just my, my dream, my aspiration. Uh, and I would also like to introduce this photo, which was taken by NASA's Perseverance Mars rover. And here you can see NASA's Ingenuity Mars helicopter hovering during its third flight to Mars um, in April. 
And we'll, we, we will be hearing more about Mars during this presentation if you have not gathered that already. Uh, but bringing us back to Earth quickly, I just wanted to thank uh, John Muland Trust Board of Directors and additional staff for attending today. And of course, all of you, we've got 41 folks online with us. If you haven't already done so, please announce yourself in the chat. It, um, let us know if you think there was ever life on Mars and will there ever be. And um, that's your way to say hello. And I'd also like to thank our event sponsors for today, Marathon, Phillips 66, Bank of the West, East Bay Regional Park District, Deutscher Properties, Chevron, and of course, our partners at Lindsay Wildlife Experience and Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Thank you, we cannot do this without you. And a little bit about John Muir Land Trust to start us off, JMLT's mission is to protect and care for open space, ranches, farms, parkland, and shoreline in the East Bay. And we define the East Bay as Contra Costa and Alameda counties. You can see here our service area. Note that Mars is not in our service area. However, I did have a dream once that we were aiming for that, uh, which, wow, what a dream. <laughs> and... I also wanted to let you know a little bit more about what we do with more than 3,500 acres and 17 properties now under stewardship, many of the most beautiful places in the East Bay are permanently preserved for recreation, wildlife, and scenic views. And I would recommend going for a hike. Um, it's beautiful out, so if you can get out on our website and come visit some of our properties. And as a part of our vision, we foster environmental awareness, and you may have joined us at Twilight at Fernandez Ranch in years past to meet wildlife, gaze at the stars, and learn about what happens in the East Bay Hills when the sun goes down. And here's a photo from Twilight 2019, and you can see a family looking through a telescope at the moon, and these telescopes are offered by Astronomical Society of the Pacific and their friends, and you can actually see David, today's presenter, in the background of this picture in that bright orange. Um, and like I said, Dave has been presenting at our Twilight event since 2018, and we're so happy to have him back. So with that, I will I'll stop sharing my screen. I, I will hand the presentation over to Dave, who may have jumped off for just a moment, but he will be back. I am sure. So um, I want to also, while Dave's getting back on here, um, share with you all uh, some other activities that you can do with the land trust in regards to um, uh, in regards to the space that we're going to be learning more about. Um, this is our visit mobile app. And if you are itching like I am to get out more on our properties, we've got a hike right here on Earth um, just for that. In fact, it's right here in the Bay Area. And so using the free visit mobile app, you can take a hike at JMLT's Fernandez Ranch, where we have scaled the, distance of the distances of the planets to a three mile trail. This way you can get a real sense of our vast solar system and learn basic facts about astronomy and the planet. And so there are five different visit tours on JMLT properties and they're highly recommended. So uh, if you wanna take a hike and learn about space, this is the way to do that. And uh, so check that out. All right, Dave, we're ready to learn more about Mars and what you've got to share with us today. Awesome. I am very excited to share it with you. Um, let me give me one second because I just mentioned this to, to you both. My computer just restarted as you were doing your overview. Um, I had everything perfectly set up, but I'm going to get our tonight's sky up in one second here. Um, I made very good to uh, try to update my computer earlier this week, but apparently uh, I might have to undo an update. But for now, see, so let's get our. Uh, well, you can kind of see how um, how someone will set up their planetarium software. I'll just uh, share it right here. Uh, all right, Stellarium. So this is a, some software called Stellarium. It's free. Anyone can download and use it at stellarium.org. There's even a web-based version. Um, I have a set for what the sky looks like right now. 
in Martinez. Watch, this is not taking time zones into account. So I'm going to move to the west and I am going to, let's see, uh, go ahead a couple hours. So this is around seven right now. You'll see the sun's getting fairly low, but it's the summer. So the sun's up higher. We got the solstice coming around the 20th of this month, which means it's going to be the longest day of the year in about three weeks. Um, if you like sleeping in, you may notice the sun is uh, also up earlier. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you can't really see much now. The moon's not out yet. Other twilights, you've actually had the moon up uh, before a sunset, but not today. However, what will it look like in a couple of hours? What's it look like around nine? We're getting, we're getting there. Um, let's see here. There we go. All right, so it's around nine o'clock. It's a little after nine. What does it look like? We've got a few bright stars. Um, oh, I'm going to do something for our landscape setting. Um, oh, you know what? There's a fun thing in this. We can pretend that uh, we're on the surface of Mars right now, which doesn't make sense completely because there's Mars there, but it's a little view. It's an option. But I just like to get rid of some of the excess trees here because as you can see, there's a planet. It's very low as the sun sets and that's Venus. So if you want to catch Venus, um, that's going to be uh, the time to do it is right after sunset. It's very bright, but it's very low to the horizon. Um, there is another bright star a little north of it. That's Capella. So you may mistake Capella for Venus as well, as I did last night. <laughs> I was like, that's a little too north. And um, the trick is you want to look for this constellation, Gemini. Um, it really won't be visible when Venus is visible. So here's what's going to happen. If you look to the west, northwest, if you've got a real clear shot of the horizon, say you're near the ocean or the bay, um, boom, you'll see bright Venus. And then above it, as Venus sets, a couple of other uh, stars and planets will show up. And that'll be Pollux, Castor, this other one. They're the, the two brightest stars in Gemini, or the twins. Um, you can see the lines there. <laughs> um, and then little Mars is going to be off a little bit um, to the west side of it. Now, uh, last year, Mars was getting pretty close. So if you had a, a telescope, you'd see some detail on it. Unfortunately, um, you won't see much today because it's very far from us and Mars is a little smaller than Earth. So while there's detail like this that we can see through the magic of the computer, uh, you would probably see a small salmon colored orb, even if you had like pretty good magnification on your telescope, unfortunately. But next year, around summer that may change <laughs> it'll be closer again mars comes close to earth mars and earth i say i should say come close together every couple of years that's how the orbits work we'll get into that in a second now um if it's getting darker and you're seeing these beautiful stars um you may also notice um up here is a couple other bright stars a little higher up and the brightest one you'll probably see is regulus and leo Leo forms a series of stars that sort of looks like a, some people described it as like a sort of a reverse question mark or like a sickle. Um, that's sort of a one half of Leo. Then you got the other half here. So this is like Leo is main and sitting down as a haunches. But I'm mentioning these bright stars here and these bright stars here in Gemini because there's a whole constellation here with no real bright stars, but it's a pretty famous one. It's Cancer. So if you're a Cancer, Here's your constellation. And there's not many bright stars in Cancer, but if you've got a pair of binoculars, um, you will see, even in like um, some light pollution, a very pretty sight. And that is the beehive cluster. You'll see a bunch of little stars pop up right in the middle of Cancer with some uh, binoculars or especially, especially binoculars or like a wide field telescope. Um, it's just a nice little treat. It's an easy one to find, fairly easy. I'm gonna just like to show that to folks. Um, so if you're near Martinez uh, as well, or the East Bay in general, um, you will be treated to a site. We're gonna skip ahead a little bit time-wise because something's gonna happen close to, oh, what's this star rising here? Oh my goodness, is it ever going fast? 
It's fairly low, but it's popping up out of the horizon near Mars and um, Gemini and going through the beehive. You're going through Cancer and going to Hydra. What is it? Oh, my. It is. Oh, it says Crew Dragon. It just docked there. Um, it's the space station. So you can see the space station and it looks very large in the screen. That's because the way these programs represent brightness is just making stuff bigger. Space station, the brightest thing you're going to see in the sky aside from the sun or the moon. So you can't miss it if it's out. If there's some low fog, then you might miss it. But you can go to spotthestation.nasa.gov. You can actually sign up for text alerts when you see it in your area. So the space station is um, always flying ahead. And, and if you miss it this tonight, um, it's going to make several more passes this weekend. So you can check it out there. And I actually, did I make a copy of the schedule in the chat? John Muir Land Trust is actually listed as a location on the Spot the Station website, by the way. <laughs> um, so you can actually uh, click on that. And where did I put my beautiful, beautiful notes that closed when my computer restarted? Here we go. <laughs> okay. Um, there we go. I, I copied this um, from their site and I'm going to put it in the chat now. It just brings you directly to the predictions for the uh, John Real Intra. So look for a um, little space station if you can. Oh, oh a rather large one. Um, one more thing. Let's see here. Where is my chat window? Oh, I know what's going on. You're doing great. Dave, it's, it's amazing Thank that you. we can see the sky and the stars and also all this information you're throwing at us. Wow. Technology. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, I got distracted by the, uh, it put the interface up instead of down. That's what I was looking. <laughs> okay, so um, there's just one other thing I wanted to show everyone. Um, it's kind of a fun little trick. Um, this is for the, as you're looking at stuff this evening. So. I am going to get rid of these uh, fun little names here for a second and these guides. So there we go. So you see, you're looking towards the north and you're like, you think you're looking towards the north. How can you be sure? Um, you'll want to look for maybe um, the most recognizable constellation in one of them. And you might see here, it's the, technically it's Ursa Major. And the pattern that you see in Ursa Major the most is right here. It is the Big Dipper. Um, it's if you don't know what a dipper is, no one told this to me when I was a kid. Um, it's like a ladle or something. You just dip it into water or soup or whatever and pour it out. So right now it looks like uh, it's pouring stuff out, if you will, which is cool because you can see these two stars here, the pointers, they point towards the North Star. And that's just the center, the, cent the thing you always want to look for. You're gonna always try to find uh, the North Star, which is not the brightest star, but it might be the most important. And I actually have a little demo you can see. I'm gonna skip ahead every hour. Um, and you can kind of watch the stars closely and notice how they sort of rotate around as I go back and forth in time. If you see a star trails picture and you notice there's like, like a little dot in the center, that's the North Star. And that's, you can see why it doesn't really move compared to all the stars around it. It's a tiny little bit of movement, but not much. And if you're taking a hike in the, say, around somewhere, say, in the beautiful area around the John Muir Land Trust or any of the other fine East Bay parks, and it, you might find yourself lost at night, look for the North Star. That'll help you navigate back out. So, and we're mostly done with the evening. I just wanted to show you one other thing you can do with the uh, Big Dipper. So we got that here again, just in case you missed it. There we go. <laughs> West, Northwest, a little low on the horizon. Um, there's a thing that you do where you can find other stars using the Big Dipper by say the handle of the Dipper. Um, you follow the arc of the handle and it will lead you to Arcturus a very bright star in the constellation of Bo Oats. Uh, I don't have a very satisfactory uh, name, uh, pronunciation of it is an ancient Greek name. Um, there's an umlaut in there, <laughs> but Bo Oats. Um, some people call it Boots. It's uh, supposed to be, I believe a herdsman. 
So you can arc to Arcturus to find Arcturus, and then spike on to Spica, which will be near the horizon and a little hard to see. There you go, yep, arc to Arcturus and speed on the Spica. <laughs> yep, thank you, Jennifer. So some of the handy ones there. Now, what we're gonna now do is I'm gonna actually look to the Southeast and I'm going to advance the time a little bit more. So it's maybe a little before sunrise, it's about four o'clock in the morning. Um, so if you say, perhaps you're like me and you have a cat that loves to wake up at four in the morning, every morning and will not stop until you feed it and then immediately have one bite of food and walk away from the bowl. Well, then maybe you'll wanna go out and take a peek outside um, at the beautiful sights you can see, which will be um, three bright celestial objects in a row from the east to the south, and they are Saturn, Jupiter, and the moon. Now, um, with uh, Saturn, of course, you've got the beautiful rings. If you've got binoculars, you're not going to really see the rings. You might see its brightest and biggest moon, Titan, and you might actually see a little hint of rings or, or at least an oblong shape. And yeah, Saturn, of course. We love it. It's so beautiful. Um, Jupiter, um, if you've got young eyes, like I've heard that children have sometimes have better, much better vision than adults and can actually make out some moons around Jupiter on their own. Um, I don't know how true that is. Um, I've heard anecdotal stories. So kids, check and see. <laughs> Compare your results with Stellarium. There will be um, four moons to the left of Jupiter if you look at it through your binoculars. Uh, this morning or telescope and it's quite a fun sight and they're usually not all arranged on one side like this it's kind of neat that they're all there sometimes they're behind or in front of it too you might only see two um, but yeah you get to see all four hey, David. and of course mm -hmm. sorry uh, we had a question about Jupiter so I just want to ask you quickly oh yes someone had mm -hmm. asked um, how come Jupiter has 79 moons or how many moons is it it's got at least 79, um, but th there could be more. Um, and sometimes it gets more. Uh, that's a great question. And uh, it's kind of a weird answer, I think. But basically, it's just because it's so big. It's very, very big. And it kind of naturally it has so much mass that it kind of naturally um, attracts objects as it comes to it. Sometimes it tears the objects apart if they get too close to Jupiter. And that's actually one suspicion of how Saturn has its rings is that maybe there is a moon that was a, it drops a little too close to the planet's surface. And that's something called a Roche limit. That's just a fancy way of saying um, moon got too close to planet. The tidal force from the planet and the other moons ripped the moon apart and created the rings. And with Jupiter, um, there is a very thin ring, ring system and it has a lot of little captured asteroids and uh, comets and stuff around it too. So, and uh, some people call Jupiter the protector of the solar system because it uses its giant mass to shield us from lots of impacts from stuff coming in from the outer solar system. However, there is a counter view that says that it may actually help aim some of them towards us more. So I suppose it's the luck of the draw. I think it's still more, the consensus is more to Jupiter kind of soaks up a lot of the potential damage that us little rocky planets in the inner solar system can get. But yeah, excellent question. And the short answer is because Jupiter is so big. That's why it has so many moons. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, different numbers. And Saturn has a lot of moons too. Um, I think is it 63 now? It's, it's There's a lot of moons around Saturn. It's funny because the moon, the numbers of moons around the large outer planets, they, um, they, they seem to keep increasing. When I was a kid, it was like dozens and yeah, as they flew more robots past them and got better telescopes, they just discovered more and more and more. It's really fun to like study the moons around the outer solar system too. They're some of my favorites. We're talking about life in the solar system. That's a, that's a potential, a big thing after Mars or the moons around uh, Jupiter and Saturn, funny enough, because they're basically planet sized. They're a couple of them are bigger than Mercury and they have water underneath uh, their surface. Oh, and of course, can't forget a beautiful little crescent moon right before sunrise. And yep, binoculars give you such a nice view. You can see a little hint of the craters and seas. And you may ask, why does the crescent shape of the moon face one way versus another? 
Does anyone know the answer of why the there's like a crescent moon, like why it faces say east or west? A chance. Give me a couple seconds. The answer is that um, it's since the moon is just reflecting the light of the sun, that's all it's doing. So you can see when it's in a crescent shape, it's close to the sun in our sky. So you'll see it as a crescent more in the morning or evening time when the sun is just rising or setting. And it's a full moon when it's opposite of the sun in the sky. So you'll notice um, when the sun sets during a full moon, the moon is rising on the other side. So it's kind of a handy little trick. <laughs> and that concludes our stargazing session for the moment. Oh, we have a couple of questions. Oh, what is a comet? Oh, simple definition. And it does get a little complicated, um, but basically a comet is, they like to call it a dirty snowball. It's a smallish rock in space, usually a few hundred to a few miles in length. It can be a little bigger or smaller. Basically, it's an asteroid-ish kind of object that has a lot of uh, water and ice in it. And when they come close to the sun, uh, that water evaporates and makes that distinctive comet tail. Um, and there's actually um, some crossover between comets and asteroids and the definitions thereof as well. But basically, comets are usually there from far out in the solar system. And then sometimes they get bumped into our solar system. And sometimes Jupiter then helps bump them in further. So they uh, go and pass by our sun and light up and make that beautiful show. Like maybe some of you were able to catch last year around this time when there was that uh, one comet um, right, at the, uh, right at evening, which is really nice. <laughs> and uh, I'll... We will um, stop sharing here. So that was fun, but shall we start talking about Mars by chance? <laughs> okay, let's get back to the questions later. Yeah, all right. So let me load this up here. We have this new fun Zoom feature, which hopefully does not restart my computer again. <laughs> okay, so. We're going to explore the stars and Mars. We've already explored the stars. And while I said Mars, there is one other little planet I think that we might want to take a quick uh, little stop at because I don't feel like we can talk about Mars without just giving a mention to Venus as well. Um, so what you're seeing here is a little a little solar system family. Uh, a lot of a lot of people are fond of calling um, Venus, Earth, and Mars sibling planets. Um, I like to include Mercury in that only because it's the fourth uh, rocky planet in our solar system, and then you have all four of these uh, in all, all four of the rocky planets in the solar system mentioned. But um, Venus and Mars are kind of right next to us in that little lineup that you see, and. Um, so with that, I'm just going to mention that um, the reason why they're considered the sister planets is, yes, they were close to each other. We're rocky with uh, some sort of atmosphere. And uh, we're of roughly similar size, more so Venus and Earth, as you can see. Uh, Mars, definitely a bit smaller. Um, and interestingly enough, all three of these planets have taken uh, different paths, as you will, in their planetary evolution and how they look. And technically, depending on the definition exactly, all three of the, these plants are also in what's called the Goldilocks zone of our solar system, where in theory, you can have a water on the surface of the planet. It gets just enough a warmth in the sun without too much, you know, to boil it off or freeze it. Um, but as you can see, um, there's only one planet we know of currently that has lots and lots of life all over its surface. And that's the one we're on now, Earth. <laughs> So, yeah, and here is a fun little question. Um, I was going to mention orbits earlier. So who is our closest neighbor? What planet is the closest neighbor to Earth? And think about that for just a second. Some of you might have an answer right away. If you want, just pop it in the chat. I'll wait a second there. So, yep, yeah. oh, we got, yep, yeah. we got a Venus. Venus, we got some mentions of Venus. Um, and if you were taking a test in science class, say, at least if I'm remembering my science test, that the answer is, yeah, Venus. 
then Mars is closest to Earth, especially at closest approach, but it's closest to Earth at its closest approach. Our planets aren't usually neatly lined up like this. It's a very, very, very rare event when they're all in this alignment. Tonight, Mercury is actually the closest planet to Earth. Um, so apologies if that seemed like a trick question. I didn't intend it to be, mostly. But I just wanted to get you all to think about how we're always moving in the solar system. And I just wrote down a little bit of this. I believe tonight, Mercury is about 53 million miles from Earth which does not sound close at all, right? <laughs> but um, by comparison, Venus, which when it's closest to Earth is about 30 to 32 million miles, tonight is actually 149 million miles away on the other side of the sun from us. And Mars is also pretty far away at 211 million miles. And to give you a sense of how much that changes for Mars, especially last year when Mars was at closest approach, I believe it was somewhere between 36 and 38 million miles away. Huge difference. And that's why um, it's so hard to see Mars now versus when it's much closer. Um, oh, and uh, if you're just wondering about the other two planets, uh, Jupiter is about 440 million miles away. Saturn is almost 900 million miles away tonight. And the moon, so close, uh, 248,000 miles away. You just hop in the car and go. <laughs> Still take you a while. <laughs> um, yeah. So just a brief little thing about Venus. Now, Venus, very important planet. Um, it's our quota. It's definitely got the sister planet nickname among astronomers, and it actually has a very thick atmosphere, thicker, I believe, than Earth's. And however, um, this picture is actually taken by not a Venus bound probe, but a probe called the Parker Solar Probe. It's a probe that literally studies the sun by getting close to it, um, but it can't stay close to the sun for very long. So it has a very speedy orbit that makes it whip around Venus to then slingshot back towards the sun, kind of dip its toes in, take a quick picture, you know, take some measurements and then get back out so it doesn't overheat. So while it's studying the sun, the mission managers have realized that they can also study Venus a little bit. So here's a picture of Venus. And I believe, oh, I forget what those uh, tracings are, if those are dust particles or um, some little bits of radiation, but you can find out more news on that uh, if you go to the Parker Solar Pro website on NASA. <laughs> Apologies if I mixed up what exactly those little lines are. <laughs> um, now, Venus, in comparison to what we're gonna talk about next, is uh, hot and cloudy. And this is actually a picture of a space probe from a space probe that landed on Venus. And I believe this is from the 80s, early 80s. This is, there was a series of Soviet probes to Venus called Venera. And they managed to stay and land on Venus and take pictures for up to, I believe, half an hour to an hour. Now, that doesn't sound impressive considering we've got stuff on Mars that's been there for what? Years? <laughs> Decades? But um, the surface of Mars, of, of Venus, is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pressure is the same as if you were to dive 3,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. And that atmosphere is carbon dioxide and sulfur, which means there is acid rain everywhere. It doesn't rain on the probe on the surface because it evaporates before it hits it, seeing it's 900 degrees. Um, but yeah, so um, let's see here. Now, the important part about Venus for us right now is that the surface of Mercury, which is closer to the sun, 800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 100 degrees less than uh, Venus is. How is that? Because it's got that thick atmosphere full of carbon dioxide. And when we first studied this in the 60s, um, that was a big revelation, I believe, um, that the extra heat. And there had been some studies into uh, greenhouse effect style of stuff from gases. And but Venus was a big wake up call for a lot of folks. And Carl Sagan, if you know that, that little name, um, he, that was one of the projects he worked on as a young scientist, was studying the climate of Venus and its atmosphere. Now, um, I was gonna, there's a little funny bit of historical trivia is that there was a, some speculation before we actually flew past uh, Venus and landed some probes that maybe underneath those thick clouds, there could be some kind of cool like jungle life or dinosaur-like creatures or whatever. 
as you can see, that is not what it looks like. <laughs> if you find a very old textbook from the 30s or 40s, it may mention that as a possibility. I love reading weird old textbooks. It's a very boring hobby of mine. Um, but we came here to talk about Mars and to think about Mars. And there's a lot of contrast between Mars and our planet and Venus and our own planet. And yeah, so we're going to start that in a second. But yeah. Um, Poll. We've got a poll before we do that. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for taking us on a little vacation in Venus. You know, it's always oh, you're welcome. So we'll start our poll. This is our first poll question. How many active missions do we have around or on Mars right now? So that would include something like a rover on the ground or something that is orbit orbiting like a satellite. So go ahead and take this poll participants and you might know, but this is, it's, all, it's okay to guess too. All right, so the answers are flooding in and we'll end the polling in five, four, three, two. Okay, and I'll share the results and Dave, go ahead, take Ooh. it away. Hey, 39% of you got the right range. <laughs> yep. Uh, the active missions on Mars right now, um, technically, I believe it is 10, um, but that depends on how you define it, because there are also technically, I believe, 13 robots currently operating around or on Mars. Some of them are multiple robots from the same mission, such as Perseverance rover with a uh, Ingenuity helicopter, for example. So that's why there's a little bit of fuzzing there. But we also have the mission, the, the nations of Earth that are currently or have a presence on Mars are the United States, China, India, and the United Arab Emirates, and um, the, the EU or Europe, the European Space Agency as a group shared mission there as well. And all the missions generally mostly cooperate. Um, yeah, there's some friction here or there, but yeah. So it's there. We have a lot of stuff going on on Mars. And here's the funny part. When I was trying to research this, um, there is a total of 49 missions total that have gone to Mars. That doesn't necessarily mean they're successful. We've had a lot of, of things have crashed or literally just flown past the planet because they, mis they misplaced a decimal point somewhere in the calculations. But we've been getting pretty good about landing at Mars recently. So it's usually weird if something doesn't land successfully on Mars now, which is a wonderful change from when I was younger. And there was a famous mission that did not land. It landed on Mars, but in the form of a crash, because um, I believe there was a conversion problem between <laughs> metric and English systems of measurement. <laughs> a little embarrassing there. We've learned a lot since then. Um, but yeah, Mars, 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 Mars. So. Yeah, here's your other, our other little rocky planet. It is smaller than Earth and Venus, but bigger than little Mercury. Um, and it's bigger than any of the moons around the outer planet. So it's got that going for itself other than uh, Mercury. Also, it's got a little atmosphere. It's thin, but it is there. You can see wispy clouds here, a little bit of dust suspended in its atmosphere. So that's how we knew even back way back in the early telescope days that Mars had an atmosphere because you could see the surface changing a little bit. Um, oh yeah, but unlike Venus, Mars is cold and dusty. How dusty does it get? Well, if you've seen the Martian, you get a little hint of that. Famously, the, the dust storm, and that's a little exaggerated for dramatic effect, um, more so the tenacity of the wind rather than the dustiness. Um, the atmosphere is very thin, so the wind they say it can't really blow you over. I'll take their word for it. I'm not sure. <laughs> there might be some special circumstances, but yeah. Um, these two pictures here, taken about a month apart, I believe, I believe by Hubble. Um, and it shows you what happens when a dust storm really kicks in on Mars. Um, the one on the left is pre-dust storm. The one on the right is it's fully engulfed in a dust storm and it's the same view of the planet. So you can see several volcanoes here peeking up. Here's those volcanoes there again, but you can see most of the detail is totally gone. You can barely even make out the ice cap. And uh, when that happens, um, for us on Earth, it usually happens when it's close, when Earth and Mars are pretty close. 
Um, it just tends to be when it's closer to the sun and that triggers a weather effect that creates more dust storms, um, which sad for if you like to take pictures of Mars from your telescope. Um, it's sad if you're a NASA controller and your space probe cannot operate fully because it's on um, solar power and the dust storm has blanked out some of the power. So a lot of times during dust storm season, the NASA actually like puts the probes in hibernation mode just to keep them safe. Doesn't need to do that for the Curiosity or Perseverance rovers though, because they are uh, nuclear powered. Um, so they just steam right through that. Um, steam's the wrong word, but you know what I mean. <laughs> they power through it. And this actually, this uh, panorama here is from the Curiosity rover um, as it was um, roaming around um, its little crater. And it is, uh, shoot, what is the name of the crater? Ah, there we go. Gale Crater. Sorry, because I had Jezero Crater on the mind, which is the crater that they landed Perseverance in. <laughs> yep. So we are going to go through a few Mars questions preemptively, and then we'll take some more Mars questions as we go along. Um, there's tons of questions about Mars, and my apologies if I cannot answer these definitively, but that's why we're studying Mars so intently. Um, let me get... I definitely need my notes for some of these. <laughs> just want to make sure I'm not giving you any bad info. Oh, oh! I just wanted to say one more thing before we start about how cold Mars is. This is something to keep in mind. Um, so uh, if you've ever visited the Arctic or the Antarctic in the winter, you may have a bit of an idea about how cold Mars is. You probably haven't done that, but if you have, I'm very jealous because I've always wanted to do that. Um, after Ever since I saw the thing as a child, which shouldn't make me want to go do it, it should make me do the opposite. Uh, but I would love to visit um, the Arctic regions, even in the worst possible time, the winter there. Um, however, Mars um, is similar to Earth in that the climate does vary. You can see this polar cap on the bottom here. That means that it's colder at the poles than it is at its equator. Right, the equator is kind of warm. In contrast, Venus, that thick atmosphere keeps it pretty uniformly warm. Um, Earth, obviously, we have a lot of climate variability, and Mars does too, but it's on the cold end of things. So it can have a high temperature of like up to 60 degrees at the equator. It's a spring day, pretty nice. Um, but uh, that can drop to um, negative 243 degrees Fahrenheit at the poles. Um, and the average temperature on Mars as a planet taken as a whole is about negative 81 degrees, which is about as good as a bad Antarctic storm in the winter, which can get a little colder, but not much colder. And um, yeah, Mars is cold, the air is very thin, and it would actually feel colder because the air is so thin. You don't, you can't really warm up with it at all. You would, um, oh, and uh, yeah. The air is so thin, it's about, uh, it's thinner than at the top of Mount Everest. It's about 130 times less thick than it is currently at sea level. So, um, and also it does have a greenhouse effect like Mars and Earth. And you'd say, but you just said it's cold. Why is there a greenhouse effect? It's got the carbon dioxide, but how can it be cold if there's a greenhouse effect? The answer is it would be even colder if it did not have greenhouse gases in its very thin atmosphere. <laughs> so they think Mars had a thicker atmosphere when it was maybe maybe even a billion years ago. That may have supported uh, water, potentially life as in some fashion. And um, yeah, but it lost its atmosphere through some mechanism we're not certain of yet, possibly the solar wind. Um, and we're left with a very thin atmosphere that's still very cold, but could actually be colder, <laughs> which is something to think about. <laughs> um, all right, so the number one question, <laughs> was there life on Mars? We don't know. <laughs> we like to think that there might have been. Um, there's no definitive answer, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so yeah, Mars had a one-time flowing water is a question. Um, it does seem like that is the case. And um, the current theory about what happened to the water is it's probably vanished as the atmosphere itself got eroded away. So the less atmosphere there was, the cooler it got, the less it could, the thinner atmosphere is, the less vapor it can support, the water may have then retreated into the planet. So there is definitely a lot of theory that there's a lot of water on Mars still but locked up at the poles and underneath the surface. And there was actually a mission in, I believe the late nineties. No, I think it was like right around the year 2000. I don't know the exact date. 
Um, it was just a lander that landed at near one of the poles and all it did one of the things it did a lot of stuff but it had one thing where it um it took a little robot arm and scraped the surface of the soil and took a picture sounds very boring but it was a big deal because that scrape along the surface showed ice right underneath the little thin patch of soil that it scraped on and it was water ice so um a big deal. I should have mentioned earlier, Mars gets cold enough that carbon dioxide also becomes ice. So that's part of the ice cap. It does not get that cold on Earth. That's how cold Mars is. <laughs> if you know carbon dioxide ice as dry ice that you might see at parties or to make things spooky at Halloween. Um, anyway, so was there life on Mars? We don't know. Very suggestive that there might have been something. There definitely was water on Mars and there's still a little bit of water hiding out here or there. Um, and then the Mars rovers that we've sent are the latest of many to investigate. And here's the funny part. Is there life on Mars now? Because <laughs> that's another question. And then again, we don't know. The only thing we do know is that there's nothing big and obvious on the surface of Mars. <laughs> like there's no, um, obviously no dinosaurs or people or even like mouse size or bug size things. So no plants or lichen or moss looking things anywhere. Um, this is actually a picture from the late 70s from uh, one of the Viking landers. So we've been send, landing stuff on Mars since the 70s. And the Viking landers actually did a test to see if there was life. Um, the problem was, is the test was inconclusive. Initially, the results were announced that they had found evidence for life. But then as the testing progressed, it looked like they found that there was no life at all. And the NASA walked back its initial statement so if you're ever wondering why NASA is pretty shy about saying anything definitive about life or anything found elsewhere, this is part of the reason. No one likes to make the big grand announcement for something and then have to walk it back like, oh, actually. Um, and that happened again in the 90s with a famous meteorite they found in Antarctica that they believe came from Mars. And they thought they found some traces of fossilized microbes in the meteor. And then afterwards, after some debate, they said no. No, that's not what it was after all. Oops. But that meteor is still mildly contested with some folks. Um, the Viking uh, life test, so to speak, is actually a big controversial subject. And the um, I think last year, the year before, a couple of the, 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 a couple of the designers for this test actually wrote a thing that said, "No, we think this actually did detect life because we tried it with soil from Earth and it had the same result." But other people then said, we tried sterile stuff in it and it did this. It's very controversial. So that's what there's all limits to what you can do when you're on the planet and having to test remotely with a robot. So unfortunately, we got no definitive results anywhere. But if can we study Mars up close, perhaps? And the answer is, oh, yes. And there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, one is we just bring people and go right there. And we're working on that right now. And it's possible that Elon Musk and SpaceX might beat NASA there, depending on their timeline, or they might just work together to do it. Um, in the meantime, the other way that we know how to st study Mars up close is via other sort of ways. Like uh, I mentioned that Martian meteorite, there are a few rocks that have been identified as having landed on Earth from Mars. But again, you know, were they contaminated after they landed on Earth? You know, there's a lot of questions about a sample that you find somewhere, even if it's Antarctica. Antarctica still has life, you know, can still be contaminated. So what they're trying to do is the Perseverance rover, which recently landed, one of its missions is to drill into in the Martian soil and collect samples. And it's going to put the samples in a little container and set it aside. It's caching them. And then there's going to be a follow-up mission that they're just in, they're working on the details of it now that is going to land. Here's the little lander right here next to my head. The idea for the lander is it lands near where the rover put its most interesting samples, its little collection of basically, I think these rocks look neat. You might want to investigate them further with better equipment than I have here at Mars. The lander lands near where the sample was tagged kind of like a geocache, right? <laughs> Defines a little prize. It puts a tiny little land rover out that will then just bring the sample back 
to the lander, which then stuffs it in a little rocket, launches it in an orbit, and then another little uh, mission will pick up that orbiting package and send it back to Earth. So that whole process has a lot of moving parts and it's very complicated, <laughs> but they're hoping to have this all resolved um, by the end of the decade. Maybe we'll have samples from Mars 2030, 2035, something like that, maybe a little earlier. Um, and why they want to bring samples back to Earth is they want to be able to test them in a more robust laboratory environment where we can actually peek, poke at it, put it in all kinds of different machines. Of course, the problem then becomes, did we contaminate it in any part of this process? So it may help um, resolve the question. It may introduce more questions, but you know, and even if astronauts land on Mars and find what they consider life, there's going to be the question of, did they contaminate the site? So the, there's a whole bunch of stuff about, you know, what someone asked, what is the definition of life earlier? That's partly why we're looking for stuff on Mars and partly what makes it such a problem. Um, basically, the definition of life is loosely a series of chemical processes that um, replicate themselves and somehow go through a sort of evolution, if you will. And that's a, that's a loose definition, and I apologize. Um, and it's not completely 100% satisfactory. I'm not sure if it makes anyone feel better, but some of the oldest philosophy that was ever found written down was people just arguing about what is the definition of life, sometimes getting hung up on is fire life. Um, this is what I remember from studying ancient Greek, um, funny enough, because fire reproduces. But ultimately, they're like, yeah, fire's not alive. Um, but viruses are a big topic about alive or not i think they're ultimately now considered alive but that's a weird one too because they change and reproduce but they also kind of hijack cells to reproduce the question is too if we find something that looks too close to life on earth on mars does that mean that life came to earth from mars there's a whole theory about if life spread around the universe in some fashion it's called panspermia um or if there is life on Mars and we don't find it, is that because we're looking for stuff too much like Earth and we just don't recognize truly alien life? So there's a lot of questions here. And I'm sorry if I'm inadvertently introducing more. And I'm gonna have one quick, um, oh, canals on Mars. Uh, you got a question about the canals on Mars? Uh, we can ask that afterwards for sure. It's not in here, but that's a great question because that ties into some fun history as well. Um, but yeah, you may be thinking, can you breathe the air on Mars? Because we have a helicopter now and you can't use a helicopter on the moon, no air. You can use a helicopter on Mars because there's enough air for it to go up and down. And you can even hear it. You can't have sound without air as well. You can't hear it. And there is a little sound clip of stuff from Mars now because there's a microphone on the Perseverance rover. Um, but you cannot breathe the air on Mars. It's too thin and it's carbon dioxide. So if you were to hang out on Mars and live there, you'd probably have a, not quite a full bulky spacesuit, but some kind of pressure suit sort of thing and a breathing apparatus. And because the air is way too thin, like you can train yourself to breathe the air on top of Everest, but it's even thinner than the air on top of Everest. And it's also poison. <laughs> so even if you breathe the air, you'd breathe it for like a minute and then just pass out. So yeah, unfortunately we cannot currently breathe the air on Mars, but we might be able to generate oxygen from the rocks on Mars and make breathable air that is a test that actually just worked, I believe, that they deployed on one of the probes. So that's a very exciting development. And that's also a way they're hoping to get fuel from Mars as well, by mixing water that's already there with some oxygen. And there's other stuff that they want to figure out how to mine. Um, and one more, one more brief thing here. Um, does Mars have moons? And yes, it's got Phobos and Deimos. Um, if anyone has played the game Doom, you know exactly where those moons are. Um, unlike in the game, they do not have a bunch of uh, scary demon aliens in them. Um, they are um, just, uh, they're thought to be either captured asteroids or bits of Mars that were knocked off in a um, impact from a meteor asteroid that may have, uh, that may be in the process of spiraling. One of them seems to be in the process of spiraling back down to Mars, funny enough. So I mentioned how planets make a ring earlier if you get a little too close to the planet. That might be happening to um, Phobos right now. You can see, if you look closely, there's these sort of lines on Phobos and they think those are stress marks from the tidal forces stretching it. 
So Mars has a couple moons, but it might not have at least one of them for very much longer. I mean, we're talking like a million years or something. And they do have eclipses. They have solar eclipses on Mars. This picture on the bottom is an eclipse from, I forget which one of the moons, eclipsing the sun. But unlike an eclipse on Earth, it does not block out the whole sun. So you don't get a cool totality effect um, because they're much smaller than our moon and they don't fill up the entire disk of the sun as viewed from Mars. Um, the fact that they're this big when viewed from Mars is just because the moons are also much closer to Mars' surface uh, than our moon is to us. Um, but yeah, they're weird moons and they are also worth investigating in their own right because yeah, two different stories about how they were created, radically different. We don't know for sure. Yep. Oh, I like that question a lot. Uh, will they put the rovers in museums once we get there? I wouldn't be surprised or if they make a little museum around them, kind of like on Futurama where they have the museum around the moon landing, which I think is also kind of funny. They might have extra stuff in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, yeah. So yeah, Mars question time. What are, else, what are some more Mars questions, folks? Or any, oh, anyone else? <laughs> so much david for this great presentation oh my gosh so much information on mars i love it and um, we, we have a lot of questions um a couple to mars and then some going back but let me just clarify some of the mars real quick i know we've got a few minutes left but hopefully people can see mm -hmm. the questions um elliot had mentioned there was flowing water and i think you had mentioned that there was water on mars at one point um mm -hmm. do we know what happened to the water is there any sort of current theories or is it still out there Oh, yep. They think it's um, the the idea is that when Mars lost its atmosphere is um, when Mars began to lose most of its, its water. Some of it retreated under the surface or to the poles, and some of it just evaporated out into space with the rest of the atmosphere. And um, the actual core of why that happened is they believe that Mars. Uh, um, lost or maybe never quite had. I'm not sure what the consensus is. There's some new science coming in literally this year about it. Um, that it's uh, the core might have cooled down in Mars. Um, it's like a, the core of a planet, of, of a rocky planet is often iron, one of the heavier elements, which if you, when it spins creates an electromagnetic field and all the planets rotate, creating it. If you got the right setup, you got a field, you know? Um, so on Earth, our magnetic field protects us in our atmosphere. Um, and uh, But Mars is very small with a kind of a tenuous hold in its atmosphere. And then the uh, solar wind, once that shield dropped, when the iron core stopped spinning and making a magnetic field, the solar wind just ripped the atmosphere off of Mars. It's one popular theory at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's, it involves several weird things that we're not entirely sure about because that's why Mars is so interesting. <laughs> and did you mention anything about the, the canals on Mars? I know Connie had that question. That it's, an, it's something dear to my heart because I love old astronomy stories. Um, there were the, the canals were spotted. Um, they were originally called Canali by an Italian astronomer in the 1800s named Schiaparelli. Um, but the Italian usage of Canali does not necessarily indicate an artificial water channel. But uh, Percival Lowell saw that and said, whoa, canals, like as we'd understand them, like, oh yeah, you, they dug some water channels on Mars. And um, he built the Lowell Observatory and observed Mars a whole lot, made extensive diagrams of the canals, which some of them you may have actually seen uh, actual water channels, like um, um, the, the Bowles Marineris, um, the deepest canyon in the solar system. Um, kind of hard to miss if you're looking at it super close. Um, so we might have seen water channels here and there, but a lot of it was, um, if you look at Mars up close and you zoom in a lot, you'll notice it's kind of wobbly and details kind of pop in and out. And that's because our atmosphere also makes things hard to see. So he was kind of seeing what he wanted to see. He wanted to see lots of an extensive canal network built by Martians, but a lot of it was just misinterpreted surface details or he was seeing water channels, um, but then was like, oh yeah, those are artificial canals. So um, that's kind of the story of the canals on Mars. And when we flew past in the sixties, we kind of got the definitive answer. It's like, yeah, no, nothing's been built here. That's a shame. I'd have loved it if they found some stuff built on Mars, but alas, they did not. <laughs> 
Wow, that's great. Very interesting. Um, also, uh, I think going back a little bit in your presentation, this is a great question from, hey, Nina. Um, when was the last time the planets were in perfect alignment? You were talking about how that never really mm. So I, I cheated and I Googled it shortly after I saw that question because I also want to know. And I actually saw a really cool alignment of a bunch of planets when I was like uh, going to school in New Mexico in like 2001. Um, that's one of the things that kind of got me on this path is like, wow, there's all the planets lined up in the sky right after sunset. It was neat. Um, it's pretty rare to have them, the, like say the eight major planets in the solar system all lined up. And um, technically, according to this one website I quickly found, um, because of the orientation and tilt of all the orbits of the planets in the solar system, because we're all a little off, um, the major planets of the solar system are never in perfect alignment um but if you're taking it as when you see them all in the same part of the sky the that would have been a thousand years ago in nine the year 949 and that won't happen again we're talking all the major planets um um us seeing it from our point of view anyway um that will happen again until 2492 <laughs> so oh, okay. it'll take quite a long time <laughs> Yeah, it's a great it's <laughs> and um, I don't think that includes if Earth is in that alignment either, just to, to make it a little more <laughs> a little more rare, because that's just if we can see it. <laughs> if if they're all in perfect alignment, including us, we would just they would either be right in front of us and the sun or right behind us. Like um, so we could see, say, um, if that happened, we wouldn't be able to see Venus and Mercury because they'd be right in front of us. We might see their shadows pass in front of the sun, but that would be it. Wow. Um, a couple more, uh, real quickly. The planets, um, someone, Stephen, was noting they're different sizes. Is there sort of a reason for that? That's just how they're created. We know that some of them are big and some are small. <laughs> That's one of the core questions in uh, planetary geology, planetary science in general. We don't know for sure why they're different sizes. Um, a lot of it might just be due to chance. Um, and the, the, even the positions of the planets might be, we still don't entirely understand it because we've found a lot of solar system outside of our own since uh, in the last 20 years. And there's all kinds of weird solar systems. So some of them, they have big gas giants right in front of the, the star and some rocky, some giant rocky planets away from the star like kind of the reverse of how our solar system set up some they're kind of mixed in um it's difficult to say because the solar systems that we do see right now are kind of the weirder ones because they stand out more our instruments aren't very clear so i guess the quick answer is we're not sure and it seems like there's a bit of it's uh, just chance and um that can also change sometimes occasionally planets merge or smash into each other as may have happened to our planet. Um, a Mars size object probably hit the earth about four and a half billion years ago. So we have now plus a little bit more mass from that. One less planet in the solar system, but also our moon was created by that impact. So we're not entirely static. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of the moon, Elena, who I think is Sophia, she said on here, um, wanted to know uh, how many people have been on the moon? Well. Ooh, 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 ooh. Um, let's see. We had Apollo 11, 12, 13 uh, kind of went around the moon. They had an accident. They were fine. Um, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So we got what? We got four, six. So 12 people have landed on the moon. Let me double check. 11, 12. Yep. 12 people. That's it. There was two people on each mission that got to land, and then one person had to stay up and orbit the moon while his friends got to hang out and have a good time. <laughs> um, yep, that's 12 so far. Um, probably more in the next few years. I know the Artemis mission from NASA is hoping to put some folks on the moon. And um, um, SpaceX, obviously, they want to do some stuff. And I believe China also wants to throw some uh, base on the moon, too. So that number is going to change pretty soon. I'm pretty sure of that. Oh, right. That's great. Um, and just a couple more. Just um, Elliot had asked if comets are continuing to shed material because they're always shedding as they go through the atmosphere. Why don't they eventually disappear? Are they always around us? Ooh, sometimes they do. 
<laughs> yeah, there's been a few. Um, oh, I forget which meteor shower it is, but um, there's a parent body, I believe, of the Geminids in December called Phaeton. And it is what's considered an extinct comet. They think it's been orbiting for so long that it's dried out for the most part. They see like little bits of dust shooting out of it now and again, but that's about it. And it looks strange. So they think that, yes, comets actually do wear themselves out um, as the one that made the, oh, so this is another thing. Meteor showers, those come from comets. The, the fun, the, the, the big tail, those little particles in the tail, um, they stay in space. And when our planet goes into where those particles were or are, that's when we get the meteor shower. And that's how you can predict them because it's the orbits of what all these old comets were. So um, Phaeton, kind of an extinct comet. It's now sort of looks like an asteroid. Um, there are comets that just straight up fall into the sun and never come back. <laughs> You'll see them, they look amazing. And then boom, those are called um, the ones that there's like sun grazing comets. That's the term. And some of them will graze the surface and come back, but then be incredibly reduced in speed or they get broken up into other smaller comets. So comets often have very long, boring lives with like a day or two of a lot of excitement. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then since we're getting over time, just one last one. What elements are on Mars? If you had covered that. Oh, um, well, that also kind of ties in. I think someone asked, oh, Tanya asked about, um, is it Tanya? Yeah, a way to make the atmosphere um, livable on Mars, right? Well, that's something called terraforming, which would mean terra earth forming, making it more like earth. Um, that's pretty controversial. It seems like it's a lot harder to do that um, than uh, they initially thought it would be. Um, but this ties in with the elements question because generally the elements that are on earth are found throughout the solar system. We're kind of all formed from the same batch of stuff. Um, there's some radioactive elements that we've made that uh, aren't on other planets unless we sent them there, like on Mars, uh, <laughs> um, Jupiter, Saturn, I believe. Um, but um, so the, all the elements are there. And so there's a question of, can you rearrange the quantities or where they are to make it more livable? Um, so Mars does have water and oxygen and carbon and iron, all the all iron because it's red and it's literally rusted um, from the the water that was there and is there in small amounts now. So same elements are on Mars as on Earth. Proportions a little different on the surface. And yeah, depending on how good we get that manipulating those, those elements on Mars means can we ever make it livable, which is a pretty big question. Um, one, I'll just leave it the, 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 the fun. There's a fun story um, from um, Alastair Reynolds, a series of books, it's these fun sci-fi books. And there is a Mars colony and terraforming project, but it's only localized in the giant canyon. And they kind of have like a glass dome on top of just the canyon <laughs> to keep the atmosphere kind of trapped in the lowest part of Mars, just focused on that. Because um, there are some practical problems, like would you restart the core to get the protective shield for the atmosphere again? You know, you, you do all this work to create an atmosphere and then like a thousand years later, it's gone again, you know? So yeah, it's tricky. Yep. Well, thank you so much. And I know we've had tons of questions and they're all great. We don't have a ton of time. So if you have any other questions or think of something, you can email JMLT or info at jmlt.org. Thank you so much, David. I'll turn it over to Hannah now. Thank you so much, David. I love the way that, that you present this information and how you've always got kind of a sci-fi twist you've got sci-fi interests and imagination and background and all the knowledge to go with it. It makes it come to life for us. And um, I feel like we've just visited a few planets. So that's not my typical afternoon. Thank you. And if you all who are watching want to watch this again, um, you can, we will have it on our website at jmlt.org backslash past events. And so not only this event, but also our previous two twilights about farming um, in Pittsburgh and the screech owl that we met that made the most beautiful noises, I swear. Um, you can go check that out. And if you had any uh, questions for myself or David, as Stephanie mentioned, um, please reach out. And David had told me a couple weeks ago that he writes a lot of blog posts on this website, nightsky.com jpl.nasa.gov 
Dave, did you want to mention um, what, what kind of content folks can find there? Yep. Um, we have a lot of different activities. Um, there's a lot of like uh, informal education stuff, like you print out handouts of like different meteor showers, activities relating to like where the planets are, constellation stuff, stories, star stories from around the world. That's in our outreach resources section. Um, and then every month, uh, every month we try to put a couple articles up to help you do something with stargazing or science or talking about NASA science in general. Uh, I just put up our latest article, which was how you can do astronomy or astrophotography just using your phone, which is a thing that a lot of people don't realize that you can do. And I encourage you to play around and try to take pictures of the sky with your phone. It's fun. <laughs> So cool, it's even more amazing ways that we can connect to the world around us and um, other other planets, other worlds, I guess. Oh, and my boss would kill me if I didn't mention. Um, you can also find an astronomy club near you with our uh, astronomy club and event locator. So there's a ton of clubs in the Bay Area and, and organizations. So you're kind of in astronomy heaven in the Bay. So just so you can find a local club right where you are to learn about astronomy. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all over we got did where everyone is in martinez the hercules stargazers are a fun group um east bay astronomical society at the chabot space and science center um the chabot space and science center lawrence hall of science i mean does exploratorium oh the tri-valley stargazers out of livermore um, i mean I, there's a lot and i now i feel like i'm gonna leave people out san francisco folks they have their observatory on top of mount tam which you can see if the sky is clear enough that's funny. They're the San Francisco astronomers, but they are on Mount Tan. Uh, <laughs> there's a Sonoma, a great club in Sonoma. If you're going wine tasting, they have their stuff open on the weekends. I think it, depending on how things go, they might have it open again soon. Though a couple of clubs had to rebuild their observatories from fires recently. Tri Valley lost theirs, but they're got a, they have some good plans to rebuild. Um, there's tons, and you can combine camping with stargazing um, in the bay. It's great. Um, down near Gilroy, um, off Hollister, there's a there's a park down there, Fremont Peak, which is not near Fremont, it's way farther south from Fremont. There's a great park, there's a campsite with an observatory set up, and that's always a very fun activity in the summer too. So, just sorry, you got me on like my favorite thing, which is all the astronomy stuff in the bay. <laughs> that's perfect. Nope, that that is totally perfect, and that's why we we wanted you to come talk about that um, connecting, being outside with King with stars is just great. So um, come hike out on John Muir Interest properties, go join one of those clubs that Dave mentioned. Uh, reach out to us if you've got questions. Thank you, Stephanie, so much for hosting us and engaging everyone. Thank you, Dave, for once again, joining us and teaching us about the stars. Um, and we will see you next time. Check out our website if you wanna watch it, watch it again. And um, hopefully we'll see you next year out on the property for Twilight 2022. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all so much. <laughs>